The Smoking Mirror, Chapter 12. Johnny stared for a long time at the entrance to the cave, Sholoto's words echoing in his head. The weight of the work before them suddenly settled on his shoulders. Physically and emotionally, he was exhausted. He wanted nothing more than to sit down beside the fire and rest for days. So instead, he shrugged and beckoned to Carol. Time to get moving. Six more of these stupid deserts left. Carol sighed. I feel like I'm at the mall going in and out of changing rooms. About that, I just wanted to half shift into the Jaguar boy or whatever. I think I can hold that form long enough to get down the mountainside. Haunted ruins, that's what's next. Do we really need an animal form for ghosts? Okay, it's worth a try. Johnny let his tonal come forward, stopping it partway through the transformation. With most of his attention on maintaining that unnatural blend of human and beast, he exited the cave and made his way along the dark path that threaded through the peaks and down the other side of the freezing mountains. The, wolf, the wolf girl followed close behind him, her labored breathing a sign of how difficult she found her transitional shape. Before long, however, the howling icy winds were gone and the twins reverted to human form with a sigh of relief. The mountain slope was gradual and carpeted with dead grass. Johnny's feet were pricked from time to time by burrs and thorns, but beyond that, the descent was pretty easy. Carol finally broke their sustained silence by clearing her throat. <clears throat> Johnny, I uh, want to apologize. I haven't been there for you like I need to be. I took refuge in my friends and left you pretty much alone. That was wrong. Johnny waved her concerns away. Oh, that wasn't your fault, Carol. I'm the one who didn't want to share his feelings, remember? I just thought that if I didn't talk about it, that if I kept my pain really close, then mom would be alive in me, you know? I was, this is kind of stupid, but I was afraid that if I talked about it, I'd start accepting it, and then I would move on. I didn't want to, you know? Yeah, I get you. Well, the good thing is, we're a team again, right? Just like when we stood up to those bullies that one time. What were we, five years old? Johnny thought of the two of them facing down a gang of kids three years older than them. He laughed at the image. Yeah, stupid Martinez kids. Their parents had them so spoiled, huh? But we didn't give them our toys that day and we ran off. We ran them off. That was pretty cool. Sure, Carol, we're a team again. The Garza twins, all we need are rings and a monkey. What? Johnny pretended to be shocked. Dude, I keep telling you, you need to watch more classic cartoons. Filling your head with a bunch of boring history is going to drive you nuts. No, listening to your weird pop culture illusions is what is going to drive me nuts. Dude, you're a girl. What do you even talk about with Nikki and all them? Because yeah, your friends don't seem all up on all this stuff, you know, like pre-Columbian political systems and stuff. Just saying. Well, we don't sit around talking about action films and 70s cartoons. We, you know, talk about... Johnny snapped his fingers. Boys. You talk about boys. Predictable. Carol flushed red and Johnny laughed. Oh man, when she starts dating, we're going to have so much fun, Dad and me, threatening the stupid punks and all. Uh, if you're done mocking me, you might look down there. Carol gestured at the valley that now spread below them. Its dark red sands were dotted with ruined stone structures of all sizes, from small homes to enormous cathedrals. Okay, ruins and ghosts, what can we expect? Based on what they've already tried, they'll want to freak us out and or separate us. So don't let the ghosts freak you out and stick close to me. Johnny smirked. Yeah, why don't you stick close to me, huh? We'll stick close to each other, all right? Her eyes flashed lupine yellow. Don't get all espanada, Carol. I'm just kidding. They soon found themselves ambling along among the ruins. The building seemed impossibly old, inscriptions and decorations worn nearly invisible by the passage of time. Johnny studied their unusual architecture, not detecting any signs of the major trends in either European or Mesoamerican design. Granted, he was still an amateur, but as far as he could tell, the structures had not been made by human hands. The dimensions were off, the symmetry awry, the engineering techniques were, frankly, alien. Carol, you're the Mexican history buff. How many ages have gone by in Aztec mythology? 
We're in the fifth, I think. Yes, this is the fifth sun, the last age. What happened to end the other ones? Oh, uh, destruction? Remember what Xolotl told us. Some gods, mainly Quetzalcoatl, kept trying to create intelligent beings, but then they'd get wiped out. Johnny nodded, running his fingers along the frame of an enormous doorway. The Balamiha have these huge were jaguars that killed off the giants of the first age. That's what one cat told me. I wonder, maybe these are buildings from all the way back then. Carol shrugged, who knows? Or maybe from one of the other ages. Unbidden, a thought rose to Jotun's consciousness. Oh man, what? Xolotl. He said it was mostly Tetz Tetzcatlipoca doing the destroying, right? Carol swallowed hard, yeah. And what about our world, the fifth one? What do the legends say? Carol squinted as if thinking hard. I'm not sure, Johnny. I'm more interested in actual history, not mythology, you know. Raising an eyebrow, Johnny gestured around them. Dude, it seems to me that mythology and history, same thing. Okay, touche or whatever. Your point? My point is, what if that's what he wants to destroy the world? Maybe he needs to kill us or something to make it happen. Carol's face went pallid. Or maybe he needs our help, our show shop. Why the heck would we help him? That's crazy. Maybe that's why he's got mom, Johnny, so he can blackmail us. The idea was sobering. Johnny tried to imagine himself choosing between his mother's life and the destruction of the entire world. Screw that, we'll find another way. We'll beat Mr. Chaos and Dark Magic, even if he is a god. And you'll fail her, a voice muttered nearby. Johnny whipped his head around and saw his grandmother fluttering spectrally in the doorway of a nearby building. Abuela Helga, Carol whispered. Yes, it's me, you cold-hearted child. You sent me to my death, so you shouldn't be surprised to find me here in the land of shades. Wait, Johnny said, we sent you to your death, but you just let go, didn't you? You had been holding on, waiting to tell us what we were. Then you escaped. Oh, you're right that I was holding on, the phantasm hissed, writhing angrily. For years I waited for you to visit me, trapped in that broken body, but you were too good to come across the border, weren't you? Too young and full of life to spend time with an old crippled woman. Tears slipped down Carol's face. Oh, Abuelita, I'm so sorry. I was selfish and unthinking. Yes, raged the apparition. You are cruel, and as a result, you didn't learn of your abilities. Your mother had no one who could help her fight off the dark that crept round your home and dragged her down. This is all your fault. Carol was openly weeping now, and Johnny's chest felt like it would burst. This isn't right, though. She wouldn't treat us like this. She wouldn't even feel that way. Not Abuela. Shh, Carol, he muttered. Stop crying. It's not her. Turning to the specter, he repeated with more confidence. You're not her. You're some demon pretending to be her. Well, you can go tell your master I said his little tricks are worth crap. We're coming for our mother and we're coming for him. He wants Shosha. We're going to give it to him. But he ain't going to like it. You tell him that, you fake. Tell him to stick his kawale where the sun don't shine. Fool, don't listen to me then. Ignore me like you've done for years. You'll pay the price and so will my daughter. With that, the ghostly form faded away. Johnny put his arm around his sister, urging her to continue walking. I know it wasn't her, Carol managed to say at last, but what she was saying was true. Maybe, but our real grandmother forgave us. You saw that. You felt it when we ran with her freed tonal under the moonlight. Whatever that was, it just used our own guilt against us. And when other quote unquote ghosts appear, they're going to do the same. So get yourself psyched up. I'm sure this is just the beginning of the attack. They continued along the black road, which for a time became the cracked cobblestones of some broad ancient highway. Lined with massive headless statues and broad shattered plinths, the road led them deeply into the remains of a mighty city overgrown with thorny black vines. Pale moths and beetles scurried over fallen granite blocks, and the eyes of vultures and ravens followed the twins as they went by. 
They were passing under a bridge-like structure that stretched over the highway when another specter stepped onto the cobblestones before them. Unmistakable in his black suit, tortoiseshell glasses, and meager goatee, the man stared at them sadly. It was their father. Putting out an arm to stop his sister, Johnny shook his head. Forget it. We know you're not really him. Don't even bother. First place, he isn't even dead. Oh, Johnny, the phantom whispered, his hazel eyes watery. Of course I wasn't dead the last time you saw me, but I couldn't bear to be without your mother anymore. Once I knew you two were safe with her sister, there was nothing keeping me from putting an end to my pain. Carol clenched her fist. You shut up. Our father would never kill himself. Wouldn't I? All those times you checked in on me, found me drunk and weeping in my study. Did you really never think that I might consider this option? I'm sorry, sweetie. I know always told you to stand strong against the darkness. But at heart, I guess I'm a coward. The worst thing is that I know the truth now. Your mother is here trapped. If only you had been faster. I suppose some of my weakness is in you too. But now it's too late. Say you rescue her. What will you three return to? The apparition began to weep. Forgive me, kids. Johnny was filled with rage. He knew this thing to be a mirage drawn from their own fears, but it felt so real, having reached into their hearts in the most cunning of ways. Ironically, it triggered the opposite reaction of what Tetzlatipoca and his servants had intended. You are not my dad. My dad loves me, and he's struggling right now to get his head sorted so that he can give Carol and me a normal life. You can point out my weaknesses and screw-ups all you want, demon, but you are not Dr. Oscar Garza. You don't even come freaking close. You couldn't even tie the man's dress shoes, you piece of scum. With an expression of sadness on his face and a disappointed shake of his head, the specter oozed into a towering pillar and could be seen no more. Carol, who looked really spooked by the somber pronouncements of the fakes, allowed Johnny to lead her along. The road led into a huge plaza ringed by thick tree stumps that had petrified over millennia. A strange echoing sound, I, I'm sorry, a strange echoing animal sound flittered through the air and Johnny felt Carol stiffen beside him. Then he heard her gasp. Oh my God, Johnny, it's Poochie. Johnny turned to where she indicated and saw the ghostly image of their favorite dog. Poochie had been at their side since they'd arrived from the hospital as newborns until she had died of old age two years ago. It had been devastating to watch her go blind and slow down until one day they discovered her curled up under a grapefruit tree, her body cold and lifeless. And when dad buried her out back, we cried like we had lost our best friend. Come to think of it, that's pretty much what happened. The apparition was young and healthy though, and ran about them with unbridled joy. Carol knelt and called to her with a soft whistle. Poochie ran at them and bounded playfully away the way she once had when she wanted to be chased. Carol, Johnny warned as his sister stood, don't even think about it. This is a trap. His sister's voice was calm but distant. I'm not stupid, Johnny. Of course it's a trap, but it's coming no matter what. So why don't we just play along? That way we have a few minutes with her, even if she isn't real. With a shrug and a sigh, Johnny went along with her. They followed the dog off the black road onto an intersecting boulevard lined with thorny black rose bushes that led toward a white tower looming in the near distance. As they came closer, Johnny saw that the building was a single piece as if cement had been poured into an impossibly massive mold. There were no apparent doors or windows, only a jagged parapet ringing the very top. The spectral canine dove into a tangle of silvery wilted herbs that encircled the tower's base and the twins came to a stop. Johnny shuddered with realization. Carol, that tower was carved from bone, from a single freaking huge bone. What sort of creature has a bone that size, Johnny? That's gotta be 30 meters tall. Well, I'm guessing whatever it was doesn't exist anymore. 
And they walked around the base of the tower looking for the ghost dog. There were no markings of any kind anywhere on the surface of the st steel and no sign of Poochie's doppelganger. Weird. So they used her to lure us here, Johnny mused aloud. So where's the trap? There's no trap, kids. Despite six months without hearing it, Johnny recognized the clip lightly accented voice immediately. Veronica Quintero de Garza stepped from within the ivory white tower, a haunting smile on her cracked lips. Her dark hair was standing out wildly in all directions, her brown eyes sunken deeply into a face stripped bare of its normal elegant makeup. I sent the vision of Poochie to draw you here, she continued, her hands reaching out to them. Johnny noted that her slacks and blouse were badly stained and torn. I don't have much time. They use this tower to send demons against you, trying to make you despair. In moments, they'll return to try again, so let me be quick, mi amor. Han sido muy valientes los dos. Very brave. I'm prouder than you can imagine. But you cannot continue. The danger is too great. Even if you get past all obstacles, when you stand before him, you'll be weakened beyond belief. And he will twist you, make you give your power to him. Rather than risk that, I'm willing to sacrifice myself. Carol, who had been trembling for a while, suddenly cried out, No, Mom, you can't. Johnny shook his head. It's a trick. It has to be. This is nuts. They're really desperate, Carol. To give themselves away like this, we scare them. What are you talking about? Johnny, that's not a fake. That's Mom. The phantom turned loving eyes on him. Yes, Johnny, listen to your sister. It's really me. Johnny laughed, finally certain. Oh, they're scared all right, and scared people always screw up. It's not her, Carol, and now you know it. Carol nodded her, closed her eyes and nodded. I guess, I guess I just wanted to believe. Their mother's double, uh, double narrowed her eyes. Kids, what are you going on about? You need to leave now. Travel counterclockwise until you come to the green road, then follow it back. You'll emerge. Carol, sing. Sing what? Anything. One of Mom's lullabies. Use the force, Luke. Closing his eyes, Johnny began to picture his mother dressed to the nines, her hair perfectly done, makeup flawless, all 168 centimeters of her joyously alive as she walked along an exhibit of her sculptures. In his mind, she turned to him and beckoned. Carol's voice began to echo in that damned wasteland, at first tentative, then with greater confidence and beauty, sounding out clear, powerful notes that seemed to set the tower thrumming. Now there's a long passage of singing in Spanish. The middle of page 118. As the dark lullaby flooded his soul with memories, his mother's face loomed larger and larger, filling his mental vision. Her eyes crinkled beautifully, and she called to him as she always did, Juan on hold, ven acá, amor, not Johnny, never Johnny. And in that moment, the love he had been bottling up within him, fearful of forgetting, frightened of losing the sound of her voice forever, came rushing out like a tide, and he instinctively directed it at the specter before him shouting with authority he had never imagined he could muster. Show us what you really are. A muffled shriek made him open his eyes. Before them, their mother's form peeled away, revealing a pterodactyl-like monster with the backward bent legs of a rooster. Its human-like face was shattered and scarred, and it spread as it spread its leathery wings, it shrieked again in bitter rage. Behold, Ishpustek, master of faces. Its voice was like the snapping of dry bones. And now I shall gladly rip yours from your foolish heads, you sniveling brats. Ishputek's wings beat the air twice, lifting about four meters. Then the demon dove at them, razor sharp talons first. Seizing the screech owl feather, Johnny transformed, clutching at his clothes and spiraling away on an updraft. Carol was now a snatch bat, and Johnny caught a glimpse of her as she raked her own obsidian claws against Ishputek's already ruined face. Fly, Johnny, fly, I'm right behind you. Catching a strange rushing current, Johnny corrected his trajectory and then hurled parallel to the black road. 
Ahead, the sky wavered and seethed like summer air above the blacktop. Twisting his agile owl head, he saw his sister gliding behind him. Below her, rushing upward, was a cloud of black. Ishbutstek, accompanied by thousands upon thousands of ravens and vultures. Well, Carol, we're almost past this desert. I see the next one up ahead. Lava plains, right? Scarface and his feathered friends can't cross over. We're almost in the clear. The warm current soon drew them to a chain of volcanoes that appeared to serve as a border between the two circles of Miklan. The mass of demonic birds had almost caught up when the twins winged their way between two bubbling calderas. An explosion of superheated gas and ash fried the hundreds of ravens and vultures who had not turned aside at the last minute. Wow, that was close, Carol projected. Yeah, those birds got extra fried extra crispy. We just need a jalapeno and some charro beans and we'd have an awesome feast. Gross! Yeah, well, after who knows how many hours or days in the underworld, I'm really working up a craving for some comfort food, you know. Anyway, four down, five to go. I think we're really getting the hang of this, yeah? And just look, a bunch of lava flows, great updrafts. I think we'll get through this desert quick. He glanced down just in time to see the enormous flying worm before it wrapped itself around him and plunged toward the fiery plains.